This meeting is being recorded. Hello all, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Lisa Sawsville, and I'm gonna admit a few more. And um, I'm with Vermont Coverts, Woodlands for Wildlife, and we're happy to be hosting this Zoom uh, with Jane Sorensen. Uh, a few housekeeping items before we get started. If you would all mute yourselves so that we don't have the background noise at your location. And we also ask that you type any questions that you might have into the chat box. Uh, right now we've got people posting where they're from and you're welcome to add that into the chat box as well. Um, I'm really excited uh, to offer this program tonight. We're offering it in collaboration with Land Ethic Vermont. And I have Jared Nunnery, the Orleans County Forester, to tell you a little bit about Land Ethic Vermont. Uh, they're helping us to fund the speaker series uh, through the Vermont Community Foundation's High Meadows Fund. Yeah, thank you very much, Lisa. And thank you, Jane. I'm really excited for this presentation. Um, so as Lisa mentioned, my name is Jared Nunnery. I'm the Orleans <laughs> Community Forester. I work for the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. And uh, as part of my work, um, and I guess part, also part of my love is I work with an organization called Land Ethic Vermont. And Land Ethic Vermont is a collaborative movement to develop, maintain, inspire, and promote the land ethic among the people of Vermont with the goal of maintaining the health of the Vermont landscape for people, wildlife, and other species. We strive to foster communication and help Vermonters connect with the land at all levels, whether it be stewarding a woodlot, a town forest, or even your front lawn. So through connection with place, we've realized that we begin to care deeply about the land and good things happen when we're connected with the land. Land Ethic Vermont evolved out of a collaborative discussion among a dozen conservation organizations in 2018 and has expanded our work across the entire state, working with many different organizations and rep representatives. You can learn more about our work of Land Ethic Vermont by visiting ourvermontwoods.org, and I'll put that address in the chat so you can see it. Um, and with that, we're really grateful uh, to have Jane here to, to present on this topic. Um, that's really exciting, especially right now as uh, spring is is very much arriving. Um, I live here in Southbury, and it's just starting to feel like spring is finally going to show up after the most recent winter snowstorm. So, with that, thank you very much, and I'll let. You take it away. All right, thanks, Jared. And uh, so I would like to welcome Jane Sorensen to the screen uh, to the presentation tonight. Uh, Jane has been involved with pollinator habitat enhancement, no. designing, educating, hey. uh, and it's been wonderful to have her on tonight. And uh, again, if everybody would please mute themselves, that would be great. And uh, Jane, I'm gonna let you take it away. Thank you so much. Okay. Great, thank you very much, Lisa and Jared. Um, so um, I am Jane Sorensen and I am the owner of Northeast Pollinator Plants and the co-owner of Riverberry Farm. And today we are going to be talking about landscape design for pollinators, gardens and habitat enhancement. And I've got a slideshow here and we'll get going on it. Oops, if I can make it move. <laughs> Maybe we'll get going. There we go. So what I'll be presenting today is we'll talk about the role <clears throat> and status of pollinators in the United States. Who are the pollinators? What makes a good uh, pollinator habitat? What it looks like? Uh, we'll go through a short list of um, some of my uh, favorite pollinator plants and some of the key ones uh, that the pollinators particularly love. And then I'll talk a little bit about what you can do to become more of an informed advocate yourself. And then a few examples of some pollinator uh, gardens. <clears throat> so what is the role of pollinators um, in human food production? I was surprised to learn that this number, it was as low as it is. 35% of global food relies upon uh, wild and or domesticated animal pollination services. And that number is the so low is primarily because our food, our diet is very heavy in grains, um, which are generally wind pollinated, such as rice, wheat and corn. And uh, but most fruit and seed production does indeed rely upon animal pollination. But <clears throat> so much of the writing about pollinators gets hung up on uh, how important pollinators are for humans. But really, when you look at you know, the real role of pollinators, you know, in my mind, it's just, it's not about us. It's about 80% of global plants 
rely upon pollinators uh, to ensure that biodiversity, you know, keeping that natural selection going. So, you know, without pollination, we would only be able to have 80% of those plants would only be able to reproduce vegetatively, which most of them cannot, and the genetic um, we, the genetic diversity would basically just stop. So when you really look at these kinds of, you know, 80% of global plants rely upon uh, pollinators, that's when you start realizing like, wow, we cannot, we cannot continue to function. We, not just as humans, but our whole biodiversity would stop uh, without pollinators or just like the bottom of the whole foundation here. Oops, I can go back. So you probably are all aware of what pollination is, but I have had some talks from someone will walk up to me and say, can you tell me what pollination is? I'm like, oh my goodness, I should really just kind of review that real quickly. So it is the transfer of the pollen from the male part of the flower to the female part of the same or ideally a different flower. Um, and it's necessary for fruit and seed production. And here you can see in the example, this middle item, you probably can't see my cursor, but this middle item, this is the female part, it's called the pistil. Um, and there's the ovule down in here. And then the, these are the male parts, so This they're called uh, the stamen and the anthers is where the pollen um, would attach. And so the pollen would transfer to um, the stigma, the top here of the pistil, and then it actually grows down into the ovule. Um, and that's when you get pollination. All right. So let's get right into the status of pollinators. It's so interesting when I talk about pollinators, people often respond first with honeybees. Um, and they'll say, oh, yeah, I've got honeybees, or my neighbor has honeybees, or I've been thinking about um, getting honeybees. But many folks aren't, don't actually realize that in North America, honeybees are, are are not native. They were introduced with the English settlers in like 1600s, and they've become very important to our food production um, in uh, in the United States. Um, but there's been a lot of um, parasite, a um, lot of issues going on with um, uh, honeybees lately. 40% uh, lost uh, in 2018 to 2019. It was the highest winter loss in 13 years. Um, <clears throat> there's all kinds of par parasite issues. Varroa mites are huge, tracheal mites. Um, and then I don't know if any of you have ever seen a uh, semi going down the highway loaded down with, you know, with hives. We transport these hives all around uh, the country kind of following the uh, flowering season. Uh, almonds has become a significant um, flowering season that honeybees are used in, although they're not really ideal uh, pollinators of, um, of almonds, but they're um, well, they're managed so they can get a large quantity of them in there. Um, you could see like there's an East Coast circuit, there's sort of a West Coast circuit, and then there's a couple, you know, kind of, kind of a Midwest thing too, like going up to the canola and coming down uh, south and uh, Florida and then to Texas. Um, then there's also sort of Midwest or um, East-West cycles too. So anyway, I mean, these bees are just traveling all around and through this process is you get a lot of transfer of diseases um, from different parts of the country and among, you know, this dense populations of these managed hives. And then colony collapse disorders, disorder <clears throat> still really not quite known. Um, what is the cause of, co of colony collapse? Um, it's amazing after so many years, we still really don't know, but it's usually uh, 20 to 30, uh, a third of the hives are lost each year and then pesticides and we'll talk more about pesticides <clears throat> later um so that's the honeybees so the native bees then are, are the native pollinators um <sighs> with the dramatic threats to honeybees uh, more and more attention is starting to be paid to the native pollinators but there's certainly much less research been done in 2007, a very significant uh, publication uh, came out. It was the work of the National Academy of Sciences, um, brought in oh, a dozen or so experts, including um, somebody from uh, UVM, whose name is escaping me. I'll call you all at midnight tonight when I remember it. <laughs> Sucks getting older, sorry. Uh, anyway, um, and uh, 
uh, this uh, this publication when it came out in 2007 was um, kind of um, was was big news and what we found was that the intent was to say the status of the pollinators and what the report really said was more the status of our knowledge um, is pretty minimal and that uh, we really need to put a lot more effort and a lot more research into finding out who our pollinators that are that are out there and you know how many do we have what are the you know the species where are they located how are they doing um, and so this publication really um, became the catalyst to a lot of research money becoming available um, for universities and for private um, researchers, um, businesses, et cetera. So it was really a, a great landmark. You can actually get a copy of this. Um, you can read, at least read the executive summary, which I think is actually pretty interesting to read. It's getting a little dated now, but it's still an interesting read. Um, and then locally, um, what is the status of pollinators? Some really great works being done, especially with the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. Kent McFarland's been very involved. Um, he, he developed the Vermont Bumblebee Survey using citizen scientists. And in 2012 and 2013, um, they asked a bunch of people if they were interested in collecting um, bees or taking pictures at least or mailing, you know, finding them in bumblebees and, and mailing them. Uh, or just so we can get them identified. And then um, after these two years of citizen scientists, these all the black circles on the map here represents um, a person who was collecting um, bees and sending them off to the Vermont Center of Eco Studies. And then the, count, the counties that are marked uh, that green, that's where we had some historical information that they could then compare uh, the current information, well, the 2012-2013 study to the historic and found that even from just this basic introductory level, that at least seven species of bumblebees appeared to be of conservation concern. Um, so anyway, Vermont Center for uh, Eco Studies continues to do some really great um, citizen scientist based work, which is great getting people out there looking and a great way to get some more information. So here's another one in 2019, uh, volunteers can now use iNaturalist app to record their observations and be included. So this gives us an even larger um, database. Um, I would highly encourage all, any of you who are interested, um, get the app if you don't have it already, the iNaturalist app, and you can start recording your observations and it will get built into the Vermont Bee Study, um, Bee Survey. Also once you register, as being a resident of Vermont. So it's a great way to get that information out there. And the way, the more of us are out there looking, the, the more we're going to know about what species we have. <clears throat> Continuing with the status of pollinators, you know, as I was saying, you know, the research is still at its infancy, but we're making some, some, some headway now. Um, lots of universities are getting involved in this. Lots of universities are starting bee labs or pollinator labs. Um, <clears throat> but there's lots of theories on what's going on with our pollinators. We're definitely finding there are um, they are at risk. Um, reduced habitat is one of the most uh, prevalent uh, ideas. I mean, as we continue to domesticate the landscape, um, and then it's, you know putting things like in this picture, you know, spreading all into lawn. Um, or then breaking up the, the landscape into fragmented habitat. And if any of you have not read any of Doug Tallamy's um, books, um, I know he spoke just a couple weeks ago um, through this same program, so hopefully mo many of you were able to watch him. Um, so anyway, Bringing Nature Home was an excellent book that really put the science of why we should be using native plants um, into the hands of you know folks like me who've been trying to you know beat that drum, but we just didn't have a lot of science to um, to rely upon to say hey you know there is a reason. Um, so Doug, I'm sure those of you who listen to he really talks about how um, yeah, insects especially, but many of our um, well, let, let's just stick with insects, really rely upon, they need the native uh, plants. That's what they're used to. That's what they can digest. That's what they'll visit. And many of them cannot, can simply not take advantage of a lot of the exotic plants that we're planting in our landscapes, especially on the residential and commercial landscape. 
And then his book, Nature's Best Hope, kind of follows that up with lots of different ideas about um, what we can do and basically turning our uh, our landscapes into the next national park <laughs> it's where we can do um, you know conservation and and create habitat um, I think I'll just move right on um, monarch butterflies and I'm sure all of you have been hearing about uh, how the monarch population uh, keeps kind of sometimes it builds up a little bit but it keeps kind of we keep losing habitat um, particularly in the Midwest, with extensive use of Roundup Ready uh, corn, um, so then whole fields can be just sprayed with Roundup, and that you know not only just kills all the weeds in the in the fields, but also all of the edges. Um, so there's like no hedgerows, no you know just blooming um, you know milkweed along in the ditches anymore. It's just kind of a, a quite a, become quite a dead zone of them. Some more theories, invasive species competing, competing with habitat species. So here in this picture is wild parsnips. I'm sure all of you have been seeing it, maybe dealing with it in your own landscapes. Um, what's interesting is like, can you say, well, yeah, you know, I've got a bunch of wild parsnips and I'm actually seeing, you know, several, uh, you know, different pollinators visiting that. And um, indeed, I was on a walk with a friend of mine and we saw some, um, there was just a one little patch of wild parsnip growing and the rest of it was just this, you know, amazing field of stuff growing. And we went over to look at the parsnip and we saw three bees that we hadn't seen on any other um, plants. And we thought, well, you know, that's interesting. But then if you look at this landscape here, which is predominantly uh, wild parsnip, it would likely be only those three bees that would be attracted. So it's their invasiveness, um, you know, by outcompeting other plants um, that be makes the uh, diversity challenged. Climate change, certainly things that are going on with climate change is that it's that phenology, um, if, you, if you not know that word, but it's basically like the timing of things when things flower or when the adult phases of the pollinators um, emerge and they're out feeding. And if, yeah, especially on with specialized relationships, um, a flower might be flowering at a different time because of, you know, things are changing or the insects are coming out at different times because of, you know, temperature changes of if they're uh, relating to temperatures as um, rather than just daylight. So things can be getting out of sync and we could be missing up, messing up that um, pollinator plant uh, relationship. Certainly insecticides, um, I'll talk a little bit more about those, I believe, in the next slide. But then the interaction of all of this as with the habitat loss and fragmentation, you can imagine there's all kinds of reasons why we're seeing a decline in our pollinator population. <clears throat> okay, neonicotinoids. I'm sure many of you have heard of neonicotinoids. They're incredibly widely used insecticides on crops. Um, um, almost all of the corn, soy, wheat, canola planted in the U.S. has been pre-treated, and neonicotinoids are a systemic pesticide, which means the uh, insecticide is absorbed through the plant and then becomes present in all parts of it, including the pollen and the nectar. And when they were first developed, I believe it was like the late 80s, early 90s, when they started getting on the market. And um, it was really, you know, a kind of a great success because it was way safer for humans and uh, mammals um, and a direct hit. You know, you could hit the insects right where they are. Um, but unfortunately, that also includes all the pollinators. Um, and then many of the household products, insecticides, in, now include the neonicotino neonicotinoids. In 2013, the EPA came up with this bee box symbol that they put now. They've added that to any of these pesticides that have the neonicotinoids. Unfortunately, it's a really nice, cute picture of a bee rather than a sort of like, watch out. <laughs> this insecticide is very dangerous. Fortunately, Vermont has, um, I believe, uh, made uh, any uh, pesticides with neonicotinoids in them, a class A pesticide, meaning that you need to actually have a pesticide applicator a license. Pesticide. So these aren't available for uh, residential, uh, for personal residential use um, anymore, but almost every other state they still are. Um, the 
EPA is currently reviewing their policies. Uh, the European Union, way back in 2013, uh, banned uh, the most uh, active or most common three neonicotinoids for two years so they could study them. And then they um, introduced all kinds of um, regulations on how they can be used and, and not be used. Um, and the U.S. is kind of quite behind um, be, uh, Europe on this. Uh, there's a lot of lobbying, a lot of money behind this. So you can imagine it's um, a tough battle. So let's jump right into who are the pollinators. You've heard me mentioning bees over and over again, but it's also butterflies and moths and wasps and flies and beetles, hummingbirds, bats, not so much in the uh, Northeast. We'll go through all of these pretty quickly, but we'll come back and talk mostly about the bees. So native bees, um, bees are the most important group of pollinators um, because they exhibit flower constancy, which means uh, the native bees tend to stick with one species at a time of uh, flowers before they'll move on to another one, which you can imagine then that's ensuring um, a much more um, successful pollination. And bees, um, you, you could kind of think of it as they don't just go out to eat, they're going to the grocery store. They, when they're going out um, looking or feeding on pollen, they're actually collecting it to bring back to feed to their offspring or to create a little bee loaf, uh, pollen loaf, whatever that they'll lay an egg on. Um, and that so they're bringing the, the pollen back to them. So they're collecting way more than um, other spe other um, um, pollinators like beetles and, and uh, moths and butterflies. They would just be, um, and most wasps, they would mostly just come and feed for themselves and not actually actively collecting. So you can imagine that the bees are way more uh, busy out there uh, making visits to lots of different flowers and getting lots of pollination done. There are over 4,000 species of native bees in North America, and there are some 300 in Vermont. I mean, how many can you name? How many can I name? Not that many. So in general, native bees can be two to three times better pollinators than honeybees. They put in longer hours. They're less disturbed by the rain. There's actually lots of them and we don't have to manage them. <laughs> they can make honeybees better pollinators. Um, hun honeybees don't have so much of that flower constancy. Um, they, they'll you know, shift around a lot more. And so the native bees with their tendency to stick with the same species can encourage honeybees to kind of uh, follow follow suit, uh, stay within a species. And um, at this point, still much less um, uh, issues with, you know, certainly colony collapse disorder, much less parasite issues or virus issues. Um, but the more we start managing, and there is going to be more and more interest in managing different uh, populations of these native bees, uh, for instance, like the blue orchard uh, bee, I believe, is one that they're considering doing some work with with almonds. That's just disconcerting for me because when we start managing these populations, we often start kind of um, putting them too many of them too close together, um, causing you know pest disease uh, interchange um, and stressing them. So anyway, I'm hoping that we can just create habitat and let them take care of themselves out there and increase their populations. So that's bees real quickly. And now let's talk about wasps. They are very important pollinators, but like I'd said, they, um, they're not doing so much collecting of, of um, pollen and they don't have those fuzzy bodies that uh, the bees do. So less pollen is attached to them. Um, pollen wasps are one group that actually do gather pollen and uh, regurgitate it uh, to, into their mud chambers to feed their larvae. Um, Wasps um, are also very important as, as predatories. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, um, they prey on um, other animals, and then the the larval stage are actually very important as um, predators for uh, many of our garden pests. So um, wasps are kind of good things, just even though they can be really annoying um, for us humans. 
Uh, here's a picture of a parasitized hornworm. If you have a hornworm in your you know, tomatoes, but it looks like this, keep that because that uh, hornworm is actually already parasitized with wasp larvae. So you're growing your own um, natural pesticide. These uh, wasps or larvae will hatch and then they'll uh, go parasitize some more hornworms and you will lose that oh, hornworm population uh, pretty fast. Yes, I'll do that. Oops, sounds like someone needs to mute their... Uh, their, themselves please um wasps drink nectar for energy while they're out hunting and sometimes waiting on flowers for other insects so parasitic wasps are critical for controlling insect populations such as aphids white flies webworms any of you who are gardeners you recognize these pests so you can see how we, we really want to keep those parasitic wasps um, out there working and then flies. Flies are part of the two winged uh, insects, which includes gnats themselves, flies, gnats, and mosquitoes. It's a really, really large group. Uh, many of them specifically visit flowers, such as the surfid fly. Um, this image here is a surfid fly. They're considered the second most important group of pollinators. You can see they kind of look like a bee, but you can see they're way less fuzzy. And another way to tell them apart from a bee is that flies' eyes are, are huge. Those eyes there are um, a great way to distinguish. They also have two wings instead of four wings. Uh, bees have four wings, but I've found that it's really hard to distinguish two or four wings, especially when they're getting them moving around. Uh, flies are very important um, pollinators for some food groups, such as chocolate, which unfortunately we can't grow in Vermont. But many of our fruits and seeds, um, you, you need them for onion uh, seed production and carrot seed production. Um, and they're also more tolerant of colder climates, uh, such as in the Arctic, or you know, certainly in Vermont. When if you got up on top of Mount Mansfield, you probably wouldn't see a whole lot of bees, but you'd probably see a lot more flies up there. Um, and then um, the forest understory, where shrubs may produce inconspicuous flowers, they may be uh, better pollinators in certain situations. So we definitely want to keep them around, keep them happy too. Beetles are the largest set of pollinating animals and due to just their sheer side, even though a majority of the beetles are not pollinators, they could still, just the beetle population alone could be capable of pollinating 88% of our 240,000 uh, flowering plant species globally. Just there's so many beetles out there. They were some of the first insects that were, um, have been known. They've, you know, found the, um, pollen and be, uh, beetles um, encased in resin, um, you know, from uh, early, early, oh, I forget what the time period is, but anyway, so it was our first sign of pollination happening um, was uh, with beetles. Um, they're particularly important pollinators for some of their ancient species, such as magnolias and spicebush, um, so interesting historical. Butterflies are by far not as efficient as pollinators as bees. They don't transfer a large amount of pollen. They've got, you know, this pretty big body and those big wings, and they have a long proboscis. Um, so they reach down in and get the nectar um, with their proboscis. So they don't um, successfully get a whole lot of pollen um, on them. However, there are a bunch of them, and they are conspicuous and active, and they do visit a great number of flowers. Um, and they can see more of that red spectrum, so they'll maybe able to see some of the flowers um, that the red or that the um, bees aren't able to see. Oops. Sometimes it goes and sometimes it doesn't. All right. The birds, um, they are very important pollinators for wildflowers throughout the world. Um, there are 2,000 bird species globally that feed on nectar and the insects and spiders associated with the uh, nectar bearing flowers. Um, what I just said there is that um, basically uh, birds are one of the big benefactors of enhancing pollinator habitat in your landscape. You can significantly increase your bird population. Um, because they benefit incredibly. You can imagine, you know, they need the seeds, nuts, and fruit and berries uh, that are available from the pollination, but also you must have heard in the um, 
talk from Doug Tallamy. I, I wasn't able to listen to it, but I have heard him speak before. And I'm sure he talked about um, how birds, um, they, you know, so need that, the volume of larval, um, larvae they need to feed, uh, in larval stage of the insects, they need to feed their young. Um, you know, it's just, it's huge. So the more um, pollinators you have around, certainly the work they're doing, the more birds you'll have. Um, so nice win-win. In the Northeast, hummingbirds are the best known, um, are, um, the most known pollinator. And some scientists believe that as many as 19 uh, plant species found in the eastern United States have co-evolved with hummingbirds. And you can imagine, you know, like they're attracted to red. They like that long tubular flower. Some of the good native plants um, you can uh, introduce or include, include in your landscape to include to increase uh, hummingbird population would be uh, the Lanister sempervirens, uh, scarlet bee balm, lemon bee balm, wild bergamot, cardinal flower, trumpet creeper, and columbine. Uh, most of those, not all those, are have red are are reddish flowers. So a review of the pollinators, bees are by far the most important um, for their quantity, quality, and diversity of pollination services. Wasp are important, but less efficient, uh, but very valuable for pest control. Flies are important, especially for the uh, more colder climate, along with the beetles, more co colder to tolerant, <clears throat> being more cold tolerant. Butterflies and moths are important, but simply <laughs> less efficient but we definitely still want to keep them out there. And hummingbirds are important specialists for natural biodiversity, um, not particularly significant for Northeast crops if we want to get hung up on our human food. Um, but given our limited time, again, we're going to focus on bees. So <clears throat> what are the basic strategies to help pollinators? As we humans continue to domesticate the landscape, our landscape choices have significant impacts on pollinator population. So here are some basic strategies to help our pollinators identify existing habitat. I mean, we're talking about, you know, you are all land, manage, land managers of some sort, I imagine, why you're involved with coverts. Um, so you identify if you have any existing habitat, most likely protect that habitat. Look for opportunities to create new habitat and manage your uh, habitat to keep it in uh, good shape to, um, and reduce and avoid pesticides. Um, simply avoid, if that's possible, pesticides in that habitat. It's all about the habitat. So what makes a habitat? Any of you who've studied any kind of ecology, it's these, those three main pillars, water, shelter, and food. Let's first talk about water. So many groups of native pollinators definitely need water or may be at least attracted to. So finding a source of pesticide-free water and mud will definitely attract bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, whether it's a bird bath, a fountain, a dripping faucet, a small pond, mud, you know, a lake, pond, river. Um, Vermont is fortunate that we have lots of um, streams and creeks, um, some ponds, some lakes, uh, some wet, lots of wetlands, um, even the water catching leaves can be involved in this. Um, if you want to add a bird bath into your landscape, that's a great idea. However, do be aware that most bird baths are just simply too deep, and if they're glazed on the inside, it's too slippery. So <clears throat> a good idea is to create, uh, add either some floating items or rocks so that bees have a, a way to navigate um, within that bird bath without drowning. And then, okay, so that's water, um, shelter, <clears throat> excuse me. A good way to encourage uh, pollinators is to provide nesting and overwintering sites near foraging areas and all the different pollinator species have somewhat different requirements. We're gonna focus a lot on bees as the most important pollinators on what kind of shelter they would be looking for. Of the 4,000 some native American bee species, over 90% are solitary. So this is very different than what we think of as you know the honeybees, which have a very socialized, very complex uh, hive structure and, and uh, you know roles. And, um, whereas the vast majority of our native bees um, are solitary, meaning that a solitary bee female constructs and stocks her own nest. 
her life cycle mostly is about a year, but we'll only see her as an adult for about three to six weeks. You know, and that's when she would be out foraging for food. <clears throat> and the vast majority of these solitary bees, 70% of them are of those solitary bees are ground nesting, meaning that they're a single, you know, a single solitary bee will be making this little network of um, nesting in the ground and uh, then making a little a bee loaf in there and lay an egg on it. And the egg, when the egg hatches into the larvae, will feed on that um, little bee loaf there, which is generally a combination of pollen and nectar and some other things that they each different species will be doing, adding. Um, another 30% could be nesting in um, uh, cavities or in uh, pith, soft pithy plants or like the stems of, you know, grasses or some stems of um, uh, even like sphagnum. It's amazing. Uh, not sphagnum. Um, what I'm trying to say. But anyway, hollow stems. Um, so to ensure access to ground and wood nesting sites within, say, 300 feet of your prime foraging area is a great way to make sure that you're keeping um, those uh, bees happy with both foraging and nesting. So social bees, the other 10% is primarily um, the honey or the um, bumblebees are primarily uh, social bees, meaning that they'll create a complex, uh, more than one female involved and in several generations. Um, some of the sweat bees also um, can be uh, occasionally nesting socially. So the humble, uh, bumblebee, um, they're very attracted to um, especially abandoned mouse nests. So if you've got a spot outside where he's like, oh, this was an old abandoned mouse nest, instead of clearing it out, leave it in there and you may be able to attract some bumblebees to there. They're attracted, the bumblebees are really attracted to a lot of different things. Uh, grass tussocks, holes in trees, cracks in the building, abandoned birdhouses, rock walls, just you know any kind of cavity they can be attracted to. Um, they develop rapidly. They're one of the first bees you'll see out foraging. Um, sometimes even as early as March, but generally by April, and you'll see um, different generations out continuing to come out all the way through October. Um, so several generations, uh, seven to eight um, generations, you might be able to see from spring through summer. Um, you can get up to several hundred uh, bees in one colony. In the fall, most bumblebees will die with the exception of a few mated queens who will leave the colony and then they hibernate in the leaf litter. This is why it's really, really important to not be raking up those leaves in the fall, but allow them to collect somewhere. If you really don't like where they are, rake them up and pile them somewhere, pile them, you know, let, or let them blow off to someplace. But that this idea of removing the leaves, it's, oh, it's such a bad idea from so many different, it's amazing compost to begin with. It's, it's the nutrients, it's the trees drop those leaves and we need the, those leaves for the nutrients. That's where the, what we're feeding our trees with. Um, but it's also really important for a lot of things to nest in. So just leave those leaves there. So we talked a little bit about, so some sweat, sweat bees are both, they can be both social and solitary. They can be nesting in the ground. Um, so anyway, overall, a, a certain level of untidiness, leaving the leaves, uh, leaving dead stems, abound, abandoned mouse nets, um, you have a better opportunity of to attract uh, those social bees as well. Um, you're seeing more and more uh, talking about these building a, a, a bee nesting box, uh, lots of information available on it. Um, but it's very, very important that if you do indeed put one of these up, build one of these, um, that you first off follow the rules, the directions on how um, to build them. But then you need to avoid uh, the spreading of disease. You need to be maintaining them every year or two. Personally, I would rather we didn't mess around with their houses and just uh, let the natural landscape, you know, create create the uh, habitat with the natural plants, and we're going to have less opportunity for the spreading of diseases. Um, the more we kind of get involved in them, 
in it, um, the more we're uh, wreaking havoc, <laughs> creating spreading of diseases. So in general, for shelter, leaving some bare ground, some undisturbed growth of native grasses, some hollow stem native shrubs, snags, brush and leaf piles, rock piles, native host plants, um, and you will provide many pollinators a preferred nest site. Don't cut back your perennials in the fall. Wait until spring or basically just don't cut them at all. I don't cut back my perennials. Most people have traditionally cleaned up their perennial gardens in the fall, but really, really, you really, if just don't, you don't need to clean them up. If you have a aesthetic problem with leaving it out there, you at least leave them until the spring, until we've had at least three consecutive days with 50 degrees. Um, and then ideally, there still could be some adults emerging um, even after this point. Don't discard them or burn them. You know, just find a, a place where you can pile them out of the way and let any of those vestige um, emerging adults and our larvae um, to emerge. So food, this is where it gets really fun and exciting. I'm really into the plants. Um, so food is the most critical habitat element in which humans can help pollinators by planting native flowering plants. Uh, according to Xerces, uh, many of you who have not heard of Xerces, Xerces Society for the Invertebrate uh, Conservation is their full name, but they mostly just go by Xerces now. They're an amazing organization that's really been at the forefront of um, educating people, working there. They um, join up with all kinds of government organizations and private organizations. Um, it's just amazing how much uh, work they've uh, they've been doing to promote and protect pollinators. Um, anyway, definitely check out their, their website. If you website Xerces, you'll, uh, you'll get to them. They've put out some books. Anyway, amazing organization. So finding food is one reason pollinators visit flowers. It's doubtful that they're actually intending to pollinate. It's just this amazing dance between flowers and uh, bees. Um, they're out there to collect food or uh, and wasps might be out there to hunt and they just happen to be sitting on the flower and getting some pollination done. But when visiting flowers, pollinators um, will, can be collecting pollen, which provides protein, nitrogen, nitrogen, amino acids, and lipids, and nectar, which provides a sugary, high energy drink. Um, if they're ingesting both of these, it actually helps the pollen to germinate in the sugary nectar and helps release those proteins and free amino acids. Um, all of you who had signed up earlier, have received an email from Lisa, which has um, this plus several more pages uh, handout that talks about um, some of the recommend, recommended um, plant species. Um, the first page um, is perennials for gardens. So these are the flowers that tend to be a little bit, you know, most of these are wildflowers. So um, but these ones tend to be a little bit more long lasting, minimally spreading. Your second page will be ones that are a little bit better for naturalizing, um, ones that are a little more short lived, but they'll put out lots of babies. That's their survival tactic. Um, anyway, and there's several more pages. It talks about trees and shrubs and vines, um, even some grasses. Um, I even have a page in there on some of the annuals that are better. These are great handouts. I definitely recommend um, you, you keeping them, using them as a guide to help you figure out um, what plants you might be able to plant. Um, and it's set up with the flowering schedule and sort of a rough idea, approximate idea of the sort of color and the height and the common name, uh, sun and shade needs. So anyway, it's, these, are, these pages are loaded with information. So for food, for um, you want to be, you know, we talked about how the bees tend to like to stick with one species before moving on another. So you can encourage, uh, help them by planting large swaths of the same species, let's say six or eight, at least of the same species, uh, species of plants for more efficient foraging and, you know, that cross pollination. So I've had this come up with this little sort of guideline um, to support a diversity of pollinators, you want to supply a diversity of flowering plants. 
though Xerces has found that 10 carefully selected species can be enough. And they've even found that at, with some research, they found a leveling off of some of that diversity. Of, they didn't necessarily find an increase in diversity of pollinators that were attracted when they got beyond plant, 20 carefully selected plant species. Um, and you want to get then planting in swaths of like six or eight um, plants of the same species. And you want to be choosing of those at least 10 species, you want to have at least three that are flowering early, three that are flowering mid, and three that are flowering sort of getting into that almost fall season. And then at least one native bunching grass, um, a lot of different pollinators will be attracted to nesting underneath that. So the guideline then is you know, like at least 10 to 20 native species with varying colors, shapes, and flowering times. And you're putting at least, let's say, ideally six plants of each. So that's 60, 10 to 6 times 10 is 60. I like to plant about four square feet per plant. So the ideal minimal <laughs> a pollinator garden would, would be, let's say, 240 square feet. But then I'll have someone say, oh, but you know, I just don't have that budget or I don't have that much space. Don't worry about it. You don't have to do it all. If you don't have that much space or a budget to get that many plants or a time to you know, manage whatever, go for the diversity over the quantity. <clears throat> and now uh, let's get into that question of native. So there's lots of native plants and you'll see people advertising, oh, we've got native plants. But you may find that many of the plants that are sold as native are actually cultivars of native plants. All of the flowers on this outside ring here are all cultivars of Echinacea purpurea. Um, this one in the top right looks the most like the native. Um, it's probably Magnus. Uh, anyway, the way to tell if uh, the name if it's a cultivar is that it will in, be in single quotes. It would say Echinacea purpurea, and then it would say Magnus in single quotes at the end. Um, Zersi says native plants are undoubtedly the best sort of food for pollinators because plants and their pollinators have co-evolved. Um, Doug Tallamy definitely talks a lot about this. Um, but much research is needed to determine if the cultivars of natives can adequately support pollinator populations due to their potentially different phenology. So when so cultivars are a, a plant that we the humans have um, monkeyed with or you know changed the color or selected colors or um, uh, the color of the flowering time might be different. Um, this top left one, they've taken the uh, pollen producing the sex part of the plants and essentially turned it into petals. So this one produces very little pollen or nectar. So it really is becomes of no value to pollinators. The flower, the shape, the height, the size, the odor, all of these things could be changing. And, um, and we just don't know how this will impact. You can see a lot of these are red, which is certainly less attractive. Um, most bees can't see red. Um, so my approach in selecting plants for pollinators, you know, until we know better is to just, if you can get your hands on the true native species rather than a cultivar, go for it. This is a picture of Annie White. She was a UVM researcher and her, her research was to was exactly this question. She wanted to, to see if, um, if true natives were more attractive than the cultivars of those. And so she had 14 different um, species of true natives and then she found one or two of the most popular cultivars and then actually studied it um, over a period of a couple of years counting visitations and a you know, very great research. Uh, she even made the cover of I don't know, the New York Times or something, I, somewhere anyway, great work. Um, she was actually my um, teaching assistant when I was teaching at UVM and she is now teaching at UVM herself. So anyway, great research. Her results were, um, it's complicated, but in general, the true, the natives preferred, much preferred um, the true native species. There were a few exceptions. Sometimes you have a few species you would find nearly comparable. 
um, the takeaway seems to be the more similar the cultivar was to the true native, um, the more likely it would be attractive um, to uh, the pollinators. Let me just back up. But really, it's if you're planning a pollinator garden, it's not about our aesthetic. It's it's really should be about attracting the most pollinators you can and and benefiting them. Um, so we need to put our aesthetics a little bit aside and recognize that the goal really is to um, create habitat for the pollinators. So native and naturalized plant plants, um, I, I'm expanding my, I definitely focus mostly on native plants, but I also find that I include in the plants that I grow and sell, many plants that are have naturalized in our area and have proven to be of high value um, to the pollinators especially some of the longer term naturalized plants and with climate change you know i'm i'm finding that you know pushing i'm pushing my uh my zones like stuff that's hardy to zone 4 i didn't used to be able to grow here i'm finding that some of these plants are are slowly um coming into you know my far north <laughs> northern vermont uh, part and I'm seeing pollinators visiting them. So I was like, okay, I'm going, these are naturalizing here and I'm going to expand um, into um, accepting some of these naturalized plants um, into, you know, my palette of plants that I accept. But again, tr mostly going with true native and then some naturalized plants that we know have a proven uh, proven benefit. Best way to tell that is go out and watch and see who's visiting uh, visiting these plants. If there's one thing, I think this audience is probably pretty aware of this, but if there is one thing I can have you take away from this message, this um, uh, presentation is to go and look at your landscape that you are responsible for and, and say, what of this lawn do I actually need? We have this, you know, it's like the wall-to-wall -wall carpeting you know and do we need this much lawn and and think about what you need the lawn for um and so for me and my landscape is like well there's some play areas and then some median pedestrian traffic areas and on our farm places that we're driving over um we'll keep that and then certainly with um, lyme disease places lawn is uh, a good way to reduce um, your exposure if it's uh, mowed lawn so lawn where I'm looking to play or to walk um, if I'm looking for something that's still somewhat permeable but other than that we just we could get rid of so much of our lawn and think of all those opportunities for habitat and then you add to that an hour of mowing generally pollutes as much as driving a car 100 miles due to the lack of catalytic converters on lawnmowers still. For most Americans, that translates to as much pollution from mowing the lawn once a week as your average week's worth of commute. Isn't that crazy? I mean, really, another good argument just to reduce our, our lawn. And then be looking to remove, um, certainly avoid planting some non-native invasive plants such as burning bush, Japanese barberry, purple loosestrife, wild parsnip, phragmites, Japanese knotweed, exotic honey honeysuckles. And as we get warmer and warmer, we're finding more and more invasive species uh, moving into our landscapes. Um, I think we don't have time to go. There's a very interesting book, The Rambunctious Garden. Um, if any of you want to read more about a sort of different perspective on um, invasive plants, um, just finding that some invasive plants may eventually find their niche. Um, anyway, I'm I'm not going to get se segued into that. It's just an interesting thing um, to learn about also. <clears throat> um, say pollinator syndromes. This is a really interesting concept that I believe it was an Italian monk, and I don't remember in what many, many generations ago came started noticing these patterns of different pollinators, different uh, pollinator groups being attracted to sort of different types of syndromes, different um, characteristics. Um, and so if you 
type web search pollinator syndromes, you can actually print out one of these nifty little uh, graphs yourself or Excel spreadsheets, whatever your, yourself. But you know, you can see that you know here with say beetles, they tend to be attracted to white or green flowers. They don't care about nectar guides, and the odor doesn't seem particularly that important to them or um, the pre nectar, but they really like ample pollen and they like certain shapes of flowers. So it's really interesting. There certainly are lots of ex exceptions, but if you're saying like, hmm, I would like to create a uh, fly garden or a moth garden or a butterfly garden or a bird garden, you know, so there, there are some syndromes, some characteristics that you uh, might be focused on. So well, let's focus, of course, on the bees. They love purple, blue, yellow, and white. So do I. They've got such good taste. <laughs> anyway, but it's not about our aesthetic or my aesthetic, but they do really have great taste and colors. Uh, butterflies, you know, they expand into that red, purple, pink, and white. Flies, brown and purple tend to be. Hummingbirds, you know that. Um, you can see all the, the stuff here. Nectar guides. So you've seen flowers, these fancy markings on flowers, and, and they're essentially like those neon signs as flashing arrows saying, nectar here, nectar here. It's the flower advertising to the pollinators how to access, how to, where to find uh, the pollen, and especially the nectar. And as I've talked about, that the bee vision tends to be on more on the shorter uh, wavelength. So they're seeing this bottom light. They're seeing much more of those purple, blue um, into the green, but not very much of the red. Whereas the humans see less of the, uh, we're seeing less of those uh, wavelength and we're bigger on the, um, the long in the red. So here's a picture of Caltha palustris, a marsh marigold, if you look at it in ultraviolet light. We can't see that it's got actually has um, some of those um, uh, like here, the, the nectar guides. It actually has essentially a nectar guide that's not visible to our eyes, but it would be visible to an insect that's have, seeing more of that shorter wavelength band. It's very interesting. And then flower shapes, um, bees, they tend to like a shallow landing lip or something tubular that they can climb into. Uh, moss, they kind of need a good wide uh, landing, but they also have this long proboscis, so they like things that they can send their proboscis in. Beetles give this image of being kind of clumsy. They nice like a nice uh, bowl to sit in. Uh, flies likely shallow um, or something very complex that they can climb into. And then there's the odors. Um, bees like sweet and spicy, just like us humans. Um, flies like rotting flesh or dung smell. Hmm. Anyway, all kinds of different syndromes that you can get uh, get involved in if you're trying to attract. So, you know, have anybody stuck their nose into a red uh, trillium? It stinks, really smells bad. And you will see that flies indeed are uh, one of the species that tend to be, or one of the groups, uh, pollinators that tend to be attracted to red trilliums. So food for the offspring, most native bees load their nest <clears throat> with food for the early stages of the young by processing the nectar and pollen they have collected and then they lay their eggs um, you know right on those little uh, loaves the pollen loaves <clears throat> or nectar loaves um, but honey and then honeybees produce honey for feeding themselves and then they'll feed their young or their brood and honey is produced primarily from nectar Whereas butterflies, moths, and many of the beetles, they actually require plants. The, the mother will lay eggs on a plant that they know that their eggs, when they hatch um, and go into the larval stage, that they can actually feed on. And so this is kind of what a lot of what Doug Tellamy was talking about, that larval stage of um, these host plants that there's can be a very specialized or some generalized, but they still primarily need to be mostly native plants that these insects are going to be able to digest. As a landscape architect in my early years of training, this would have been back in the 70s um, and into the 80s. We, the, our plant list was filled with such and such japonica and such and such chinensis. And part of our reasoning for going with these plants was that the insects didn't eat them, meaning we were creating these incredibly dead landscapes. 
And here it is, you know, piles of years later, reading Doug Tallamy's book and going, whoa, interesting. You know, this was intentional that we were creating these dead landscapes where these insects, you know, had nothing to feed on. The Connor blue butterfly is nearly, um, it's fairly endangered. Um, probably none of you have seen one in Vermont. Um, they're very much dependent upon the Lupinus perennis, the true native uh, northeast lupin. And our love of lupin has pretty much wiped out the corner blue butterfly because when we started planting lupins all over our highways and in our landscapes at home, our residential landscapes, we have primarily been planting cultivars of the western <clears throat> um, lupin. And it crosses these lupin tend to be pretty short lived and lived and they reseed abundantly. Uh, when they cross with, and when our native, true native, the Lupinus perennis, crosses with this western one, um, the western one is more predominant and, and you know, in, in its genetics. And so we lose out on our native uh, east, uh, and the carnar blue butterfly cannot digest, its larvae cannot digest the west, <laughs> western lupine. So, this is one of the things we do know. So just, you know, we, there's so many insects we don't know about. And so this is a really good case how important it is to just stick with those two native plants as much as possible um, so that we can ensure that our insects are finding food. So what does a good pollinator habitat uh, look like? It can take lots of different forms. It can be a garden, a cottage garden, or a naturalized garden, a meadow. It can be a pollinator lawn, even your hedgerows and corridors along your stream side, minimi minimally managed natural areas, and even your containers on your deck or your you know, window boxes can be great pollinator habitat. So let's start with a garden. It generally implies a very intentional layout of plants. And so the plants that you want to be using, if you're wanting to make it a little bit more pollinator friendly, um, you might be wanting to look and be wanting to be more of a garden with a sort of a more intentional layout. Um, you want to be looking for plants that are more garden worthy, that are long lasting and well behaved. And so that handout, um, the first page are the ones that tend to be a little bit more well behaved. Um, they don't reseed quite as abundantly. They don't spread so rampantly with underground runners. Um, and they are not a, a short lived. Um, and a really good idea with your gardens is try to rely more upon ground covers as possible rather than mulching because we talked about how 90% of those solitary bees are mostly ground nesting and that heavy mulching is really uh, challenging for them to get into the ground. But ground covers, they can uh, negotiate through that much more readily. So a good shout out for trying to encourage more ground covers or just allowing the leaves to uh, generally, you know, just gather the leaves that fall from trees and blow around, they'll gather in there and it becomes this great natural uh, mulch, but it's not as dense as that bark mulch that we may use and the bees can get into nesting and other insects can get into nesting in there. Um, I, I do want to add, Lisa had mentioned, you know, with the handout, anybody who signed up a little bit later um, didn't get the email that had the handout um, and that she will be, when the this recording becomes available, she'll send out that link to everyone who signed up and she'll attach the handout then. So um, you will all get the, the handout, uh, either another copy of it then or <laughs> your first copy of it then. So then um, we've gone from gardens and then we can go into sort of a more naturalizing or a cottage garden It's by definition uh, more informal. So a cottage garden, you know, in Europe, that's kind of a common phrase, um, but it's basically a cottage garden concept is sort of more of a naturalizing where you include a lot of intentionally self-seeding uh, spreading perennials and you kind of let them play it out. In some ways it sounds like, wow, this would be, you know, really super easy, but in some ways it actually requires a more knowledgeable gardener because you could have a species that could become quite rogue or taking on total dominance. So you really need to be able to recognize those young seedlings going like, hmm, I don't think I want a whole batch of that Monarda over here. I think I'll pull some of these out here and maybe transplant some of them over here. 
Um, but it, you know, you're definitely letting it take on some of its own patterns of its own. It's, it's quite fun. <clears throat> so if you're going to plant um, any any perennial planting, um, it's really important that you don't just go out there and rototill and turn up your soil. Um, that is going to bring up all kinds of weed seeds. Granted, some of those weed seeds may be great pollinator plants, um, but it's going to bring up all kinds of new uh, weed seeds. Uh, a better idea is to um, to mow if it's grass or even if it's you know an existing garden, just mow it and smother it with black plastic. This can take up to six months. So, you know, or start early in the spring and then remove it in September and you can do um, a fall planting then. Or you can sheet compost. Um, if you look up sheet composting, you'll find all kinds of, or um, lasagna method, there's all kinds of um, phrases for it. But if you look that up, there's all kinds of um, um, recipes on that. Um, most of them call for a whole, like, foot to two foot worth of material. Um, part, personally, I haven't done a whole lot of it. I don't do either uh, the smothering um, with black plastic, but I'm also kind of an impatient person. I do a lot of sod cutting. So I rent a sod cutter like this machine here. Um, and then I, you know, cut the sod, you roll it up, you get rid of it, and you're ready to plant immediately. You haven't really disturbed the soil. Granted, you've taken away a good inch or, inch or two of your topsoil but you've got a great um, clear bed with very little weed pressure coming in. You can rototill, but you have to go shallower and shallower and shallower and take at least six weeks, probably more like uh, two months. And by the end, you're just basically raking. And the idea is that you're turning the soil and then you're going shallower and shallower and you're letting um, the weeds germinate and then you're raking them off. Honestly, this method, um, I have tried this in one place and I found that it, 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 I had a lot of weed stuff, a lot of weed pressure. So it uh, didn't work so well for me. A meadow, you can create a meadow by removing, killing the existing plant cover and seeding with pollinator friendly native species. Um, ideally having your seeds sourced as locally as possible. Um, again, you can do this by the shallow cultivation. Um, this is a, a tine, tine weeder, a horticulture, vinegar, I have to say, I haven't found that be phenomenally um, great. What I tend to do is I uh, mow. Um, I've got some places out in the farm where I've been covering with this large piece, large piece of black plastic and I let it sit there. Um, I basically cover it in the fall um, of one year and then the next fall. So I let it sit there for a full year and then I plant in the fall uh, with my, whatever plants I have left from my Northeast pollinator plant business. Um, uh, anyway, I find that's just a great way to create this great planting bed. Um, another idea is you can just, if there is a part of your landscape that you believe that it was never actually really planted with you know, Kentucky bluegrass and you know, some lawn seed mix, that it was just an area that someone started mowing. If you stopped mowing, you might find, you know, initially it's going to be a lot of grasses, but you may find that there may be lots of stuff that starts growing in there. I have an area next to the barn that I said, this is crazy that I mow this. There's no reason for me to be mowing this area. Stop mowing and they have this huge milkweed population. Another area where a Joe pie weed and um, New England aster grew in like crazy. It's like, wow, just stop mowing. A really cheap way to create some pollinator habitat. And if you find that like, meh, not a whole lot's growing in there. You can start doing some pocket planting here and there to, to, to increase your diversity. So, you know, some of these places may be uh, like a steep hillside or, uh, you know, step back 20 feet from the forest edge or along a roadway, or, you know, a stream bank, you know, places that are, you know, around a pond. You know, just stop mowing some of these areas and see what grows in. Pollinator lawn, this is a really great thing to do. If you have a part of your landscape where you, you're you going out there and you're doing what I suggested, like, let me look at my lawn. Where do I really need it? It's like, 
You know, we don't actually play out there. We rarely walk out there, but we do like just having that open expanse. You know, we like the view in that area. It would be a great opportunity to create a pollinator lawn. Um, this past fall, um, I've got this orchard where, you know, I granted I don't need to walk out there very much unless we're pruning or collecting. But, you know, otherwise I've been mowing. It's insane to mow around all these trees. Thought this is a great opportunity to develop a bee lawn. <clears throat> and so um, what you want to do is I actually rented a sod cutter and got rid of the lawn altogether because it just felt like it was going to be competing too much. And then I added um, five different species of different um, types of uh, fine fescue and then um, added some white clover and all site clover seeds and then planted into it several of the small growing uh, sort of ground covery kind of plants such as violets and uh, strawberries, uh, the wild strawberries, um, the prunella self-heal. Um, so I've got this great diversity of plants of flowering. Um, it has this nice open look to it, um, but I don't need to mow it. And if I choose to mow it, I could still choose to mow it and give it this nice, you know, clean look. If there was a, you know, time where it's like, oh, I just kind of want to clean this up. You can still mow it. Everything will grow back in fine, but you mostly just don't have to mow it. Great alternative to the mown lawn. Fine fescue will only get to be about eight to 10 inches tall. Um, it's very pretty grass, can handle a fair bit of shade. Hedgerows and corridors are a great opportunity to connect um, existing and proposed habitat, so giving corridors for those um, pollinators to connect from one spot to another. Um, this can be like the edge of a field or, um, you know, you can just imagine any, anywhere you have a great opportunity to collect, to connect habitat. Um, certainly stream sides, uh, streams become also another great way to make those linear habitat connections um, ditches along the road great way also um, and uh, there used to be this attitude that you needed to keep ditches clear of vegetation but if you actually uh, plant that with a lot of deep-rooted native plants it's a great way to increase the saturation um, those deep-rooted plants really help draw that water down in a minimally managed area. So you might have, let's say, um, you know, I just think of across the road from us, we've got a, um, a pipe or a mm, power line. And boy, the diversity of stuff that grows in there. Um, being an organic farm, uh, we, we, you know, everyone is allowed to request the power companies to not spray under their um, their power lines in your area and we're an organic vegetable farm and so we you know request that you know, they cannot be spraying herbicides on our farm and the stuff that allows we allow that does grow up in there it's just great pollinator habitat so anyway any kind of minimally managed area um, and in the northeast if it's not managed I mean you know mowed maybe every three years or, or uh, burned or something it will grow up into woody plants and then will not be um, that kind of um, landscape um, and then every little bit can help. So containers are a great opportunity. That last page of the handout um, has lots of different um, annuals that are actually very good at providing uh, pollen and nectar um, for uh, pollinators. It certainly att attracts them, probably not the best nutrient mix maybe as the true natives, um, but you will find them definitely visiting them and getting a little sugary hit and some energy and pollen attaching to their the, the furry bodies of the of the bees. So anyway, um, every little bit can help. So if you can't create a you know 10 acre pollinator habitat, you can maybe get a window box going at least that might be helping out. So a summary of what makes a good pollinator habitat. So food, 10 to 20 nectar and pollen rich plants offering a variety of flower shapes, colors, generally in an open sunny area. Um, uh, you can follow those pollinator syndromes, um, giving you some guidelines. 
Make sure you're having constant and overlapping sequence of flowering, planting in large swaths, and ideally mostly native plants. Um, I'm finding that um, the perennials are really great for, you know, really paying attention for that long season. A lot of the shrubs can help out for that long season. The native trees are excellent for the early, early um, pollination visit. Many of our native trees um, are wind pollinated, but we do find that um, particularly the understory trees, you know, like the cherries, um, shad, shad, uh, shad bush, um, you know, Juneberry. Um, a lot of those understory plants are really excellent for attracting pollinators. Um, um, provide water. And, and again, in Vermont, we have lots of water opportunities. But if you would like to add water, make sure it's pesticide free and chlorine free. Um, sh shelter, uh, again, remembering most of our bees, especially and many of our other insects are ground nesting. Um, and native growth, native growth of native grass. Grasses of um, native grasses are great opportunities. Um, leaving your leaves, keeping so there's opportunities for the uh, insects to be able to get through those leaves and down into the ground. Right. Trying to avoid ground cover as much as I mean, not ground cover, um, mulch as much as possible. Uh, native and some naturalized host plants for butterflies and moths and some of those beetles, snags, brush, leaf piles, rock piles. Basically, just not tidying up so much, you're going to be creating well, lots of shelter opportunities. Um, and remembering that you know, your habitat can take many different shapes. It can be a garden, a meadow, pollinator lawns, hedgerows, streamside revegetation, mentally managed areas, uh, natural areas, containers. Just checking our time. I think we're doing okay here. So then what plants do you want to plant? Well, you've got the handout. Those of you that have the handout, the rest of you will be able to get it uh, shortly, hopefully. Um, but a really great way, if you want to do some research yourself, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center is in Texas. Uh, Xerces Society worked with um, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center to um, help create this uh, special collections that's uh, plants that are particularly valuable to native bees. They have one for native bees and they have one for bumblebees. Um, so anyway, if you go to the Wild Bird, uh, the Wildflower Center, you can click on native bees, scroll down, you can click on bee friendly plants. Um, you can get into the special collections and then there will be a panel where you can choose your state. You can say, oh, I want trees or I want shrubs. Um, herbs are the phrase they use for perennials. Um, you can look at grasses. Um, you can say what sun or, sh or shade you have, the soil types, you know, if it's sandier or heavier. Um, you can even select colors or heights. You can get this amazing um, list of plants. I have to say, this Wildflower Center, they frequently change how this is set up. So even now, it probably wasn't even that long ago that I revised this, it's changed again. But anyway, if you go to the Wildflower Center, you will likely eventually find the um, this link to special value to native bees where you can come up with your own plant list. I like to make sure um, uh, that website, the Wildflower Center, is really good, um, but I also like to check to make sure the native status. I use BONAP Napa, which is the bio Biota of North America program, North American Plant Atlas. I have to say for years they stumped me. This dark green, when you're looking at the county level, which is really cool that they've got the information even at the county level, the dark green, despite what their color diagram says, is really just the state background color. When you're looking at the count county level, they've just used green, dark green to fill in. It doesn't mean that the plant is native everywhere <laughs> than within that state, within the county. So yellow means it's rare. This green, this light green, means that it's actually native in those county. And then that more teal color means that it's been naturalized in those counties. Whoops. Yeah, I'll come back. Wow, that went way back. So again, dark green is native in the country, not necessarily the state. Light green is native, but not rare at the county level. Ye yellow is rare and teal. Anyway, they do have a definition of it. Anyway, it's a really great. A uh, great way to check the actual native status. 
So another way, so this is like you had you created that big list, and then I want to check on you know refine that list. So you have this great list, um, but you want to know are these plants that you want? You you want to make sure that they're um, not rare or endangered or extinct in your state, and that's a weird thing to say. Well, but why wouldn't I want to be introducing those? Um, because if the plant is rare or endangered, you really want to make sure you're not polluting by bringing in plants that are not are seed from if you have you know locally collected seeds then you're not endangering that population but if you're getting seeds from far away let's say like oh i was able to get some seeds but they're from california that local jurisdiction of those you know where the seeds are coming from can um impact you know flower timing and flower you know it it, it could have co-evolved ever so slightly different getting into the weeds here but anyway so you need to decide if you like its appearance is it hardy to your range um good for your special conditions if you're drier or wetter or sunnier or shade and then doing a little research on if you've decided you're creating a garden or more of a meadow, you know you need to decide how you want. Does it? How does this plant um, behave? And you may not get all that information from that Wildflower Center uh, book or website. Um, so here's some other places to check the William Kalina, Kalina's uh, Wildflower book. This is an excellent book that really gets into the sort of how those, this is a great book on if you're wanting to grow these seeds, has great directions. Um, Heather Holm has some great information. I love particularly the Missouri Botanical Gardens website. Um, they cryptically give you the information. You can look up these plants and say, and they'll have a little blurb that will say, oh, tends to reseed or uh, tends to have this height, this size of flower. Um, uh, it's well behaved. Um, anyway, so I love to check the Missouri Botanical Garden website on uh, information on whether I'm going to like this plant or not. You know, will it work well with the particular situation I'm in? Um, sourcing seeds. So again, I was getting into this as locally as possible. Consider collecting your own. Um, <laughs> get out there and start finding seeds. Um, if you're collecting not on your own property, you actually need to get permission, <laughs> ideally. Um, and there can be issues with hard to germinate. Um, most will need stratification, which basically means you're simulating winter. Um, I don't have yeah, your prairie moon nursery has an excellent source for plants but unfortunately they're midwestern um we're, we're it's so weird in new england many other areas of the united states have great access to local seeds um local regional seeds especially like the midwest was probably one of the first areas with the prairie they started uh, reinvesting in collecting seeds creating uh, more habitat um prairie habitat california has been big the northwest um you get down into like pennsylvania new jersey they've been getting the south has been really great new england the northeast eh, we're so far behind uh the native plant trust is starting up a new effort and there's been some efforts in connecticut through uh the nofa natural organic farmers association in connecticut has started some good local seed collecting uh, years ago, I collect. I created this Northeast Wild Seed Collectors, um, trying to encourage people to um, collect seeds. Um, take a take a look at this website if you're interested in collecting seeds. But anyway, in the meanwhile, um, we, we do have places where we can get some seeds, but again, not very much from local ecotype seeds. The Wild Seed Project is out in Maine, and most of their seeds are actually wild collected. Um, some are garden collected, so most of them, and you can ask them, you know, which of these are are true wild. Prairie Moon is an amazing resource, but again, it's Midwest, um, but they will have pretty much all the seeds you'd be looking for. Ernst is really, um, they only sell in sort of larger quantities, and I believe they're essentially wholesale. Jolito, I have to admit, there's some things I can't get seeds for, and I occasionally get from them. They're in Germany. They will not tell me where they're getting their seeds. I think they just don't keep track of it. But occasionally you can get seeds from them. So anyway, 
Seeds, okay, then native plants. I wish I could have this huge list. It's starting to grow. I'm starting to find there are increasingly garden centers that are starting to sell um, native plants, but there's it's still few and far between. Um, Northeast pollinator plants, I'm not trying to toot my own horn here, but look, this is where you can get um, uh, you know, a nice huge list of, I think I've got some 75, 80 plants now, that are, you know, mostly wildflowers. Um, we also sell the farm plants at our farm. Uh, the plants will become, don't become available until um, June 1st, and they're available till the end of September. If you go to the Northeast Pollinator Plant website, you can see what plants uh, we're suggesting and offering. So it's a great place to, you know, if you want to grow your own, great idea. Again, if you're going to grow your own from seeds, most of these plants are going to need a month or two in the refrigerator with in cold, uh, wet um, potting mix to kind of simulate winter before they'll be ready to germinate. Uh, North Creek Nursery is in Pennsylvania. They were one of the first um, to really get into native plants. I've been doing it for a long time. Wholesale only is uh, Van Berkham. Um, so anyway, let's get into, how's my time? I've got half an hour. I want to leave some time for talking, so we'll go through this pretty quickly or for uh, questions and such. So I've got a very short list of plants, uh, some of my favorites, um, my bee's favorites <laughs> for pollinator gardens. And these ones are the ones that are going to be more longer lasting and less spreading or uh, uh, more naturalizing. So we'll kind of breaking it down into two groups. And that first two pages of the, of the handout kind of breaks it down into those garden versus sort of more naturalizing. So um, in the pollinator habitat, the perennials are, I find, the most important plant group for providing copious pollen and nectar for pollinators. Most perennials will start flowering, gradually peak for a, gradually, and then they'll peak for about three weeks and then they'll taper off. You may get about six weeks of flowering, but it's really kind of a three week is your prime flowering time. Again, there's lots of exceptions. Some flower longer, some flower shorter. Um, and many of these perennials also serve as larval host plants for those butterflies, moths, and some beetles. Oops. I went backward. Okay, um, then that handout you have, um, there also covers trees and shrubs and vines and grasses, and herbs and annuals. Um, we're not going to be getting into them. We're only going to focus on the uh, perennials here. So Agastache funiculum. This is actually not native to Vermont. It is native to some of New England. Flowers for a really long time and late, has this great sort of anise smell to it. Um, three to five feet, I'd say it's more down in that three uh, foot height for me. It can handle it pretty moist, but it can also handle pretty dry. Uh, great, great, great plant. It does tend to reseed a little bit, very hardy. It'll tracks a lot of different things. This is a great plant, Aruncus dioecious, uh, the goat's beard, great for a part to full shade, great for its larval host plant. This little green symbol here looking like a larvae emerging or a, a pupae maybe emerging. And then it's also great for butterflies, uh, these great plumes of flowers. Baptisia, absolutely one of my favorites. It looks almost like a shrub. Definitely a great value. It has a long, it's very early flowering. I would I would shift this even earlier. Supposedly toxic, but it doesn't taste good. So I don't think anybody's really going to be eating it. Uh, Chalone glabra, great for the shade. About two to three feet. Um, it can handle a fair bit of sun also. Um, Butterflies love it. It's larval host. Um, it's really interesting. I should add bees because I definitely see a lot of bumblebees. They climb inside of the flower and then when they're climbing inside of there, it looks like the flower is chewing on them. It's kind of a funny little <laughs> cute, cute look. Uh, Coreopsis is a pretty common um, garden flower already and I see lots of bees and butterflies visiting it fairly early flowering. It tends to be a little bit short-lived so you know maybe after two or three years your patch might be getting a little bit bare and you might need to do a little replanting but it it reseeds pretty easily. Uh, I mean you can seed it pretty easily and and plant some more out there. Echinacea purpurea it's naturalized to New England and this is definitely one of those plants that's got a proven Man, you, 
it, the visitation, the pollinators visiting this is amazing. And if you leave those seed heads, do not clean up your perennials in the fall. The amount of birds ha ha eating the seeds all winter is amazing. Um, and again, this is one of the flowers that you can find so many cultivars of. Go for the true native. It's gorgeous. It's amazing. The bees will, be will thank you. The butterflies, the birds, the hummingbirds, super popular. Eutrochia maculata, you probably have all seen this, tends to like it more a little bit in the wettish areas, attracts a lot of bees and butterflies, flowers really long and late in the season. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Eutrochia purpureum, this is actually rare in Vermont, um, but it is native to New England, except for Maine. Again, a very similar look to the maculatum. Um, this one's called the sweet joe pieweed. Um, it tends to handle a little drier uh, soils. Eupatorium, this is a common roadside plant. Never found it attractive until I became attracted to pollinators. <laughs> and now I love this plant. Just amazing, amazing plant. It's great in the garden too. And I find that it's not for my really dry soils. It doesn't recede very much. So I put it into this category. So I'm a little biased. If you have pretty wet or moist soils, you probably will find it to be a pretty, um, it might recede way more than my experience. Um, the wild strawberry, Fragaria virginiana, is great for a ground cover. And you get this little bit extra benefit of, you know, some great tasting fruit. Can handle it pretty dry to medium, lots of pollinators. Great, great ground cover plant. Helenium, this is a really tall one, three to five feet tall. Lots of pollinators attracted to it. Nice late flowering, pretty statuesque. I have never found the need to stake it, but again, my ground is pretty dry, so it probably doesn't get as tall as some of you might get it. Leatris aspera, this is, um, you probably are familiar with the next one. Yeah, Leatris spicata. This is a very common um, garden flower. This one is a little looser, um, looks a little bit more naturalized. Both of these are great uh, plant, plants um, for pollinators, for larval hosts, birds. Amazing plants, pretty nice late flowering, nice color. Minarda fitzgelosa, the wild bergamot. This one is a bumblebee haven, so very special value to bees and bumblebees. Butterflies, hummingbirds, and then the seeds, seed heads. Um, it can um, self-seed fairly aggressively, but not. it's not hard. I, I got a lot of it growing here, and I kind of let it um create new patches here and there um it's it's not hard to pull out if you don't like where it's growing it, it likes the drier soils as well it can handle some moisture penstemon um dry to medium it's a really beautiful plant you can see the, you know the that head the hummingbirds would be into this as well as the, the butterflies love it um but so do several species of bees wants to be in fairly good sun uh, kind of clump forming, one of the very, very earliest uh, flowers to flower. Pycnanthemum, I absolutely adore this. Um, it looks kind of like Achillea. <laughs> yarrow, it looks a lot, I can never think of common names. It looks a lot like yarrow, um, but it's a little daintier. Um, there's all kinds of beetles that are attracted to it, as well as bees and butterfly. Um, I absolutely love it. Um, there's lots of different pycnanthemum. If you're going to put it in a garden setting, I would go with a tenufolium because it tends to be less aggressive. All of the other pycnanthemum, anything in the mint family is going to be pretty aggressive, but this particularly one, the narrow leaf one, tends to be more well-behaved. So I keep it in this list here on the well-behaved plants. Red a bit of pretty tall. Pinata, yellow coneflower. Um, it's really fun watching the insects visit this thing. A common roadside plant, very valuable. Does recede a little bit, but not at a pesty level. Saladega sacio. So this is a goldenrod. This is a goldenrod that definitely doesn't spread anything like um, a lot of the goldenrods that we're familiar with. And it's really, really gorgeous. A lot of the cultivars have been created out of this particular one, as well as the Saladega rugosa. Um, which has this sort of really interesting arching uh, yellow, you know, the stem, the flowers um, bloom throughout across the whole stem is really kind of gorgeous and, and creates this great habitat to watch these, uh, you know, the diversity of bees, especially as well as the seed heads for the birds. Um, excellent plant. 
Um, then we get in, there's all kinds of asters. This is, uh, I don't, I, aster was such a nice term, but the, for some reason, the botanist had to turn it into symphiotrichum. Anyway, way more of a mouthful. <laughs> but these are the symphiotrichum is the new uh, genus name for the asters. Um, this is a smooth, smooth blue, a smooth blue aster native to almost all of the United States. All of the asters tend to flower towards the end of the season. Uh, this is a New England aster. I know you've seen it growing. It can be a little bit variable in its color, um, but mostly it's in this sort of magenta-y, purpley flowering. Um, can spread some. Great for the look great season. Novi belgi tends to be much lighter. This is the New York aster, a little bit lighter in color. Again, great uh, for flowering. Tradescantia. This is a fairly early blooming. It looks a little bit like an iris um, in its leaves. Tends to like it a little bit moist and a little bit acid. Um, it can handle a fair bit of shade. I also have it growing in full sun. It seems to be fine. Um, given my really dry conditions, I'm surprised how often I see it kind of uh, growing around here, but it seems to be doing just fine. Vernonia, this is one of my very, very, very favorite for the end of the season. It's fairly tall, very statuesque, amazing color, and the diversity of insects that are attracted to it. It's just phenomenal. Okay, now let's get into the short list. Uh, bummer, I have run out of time. <laughs> okay, real quick. I'll just let you look at them. So these are the more naturalizing <clears throat> fireweed I'm starting to see growing around this area. This one you see these these things sticking to you. This is a great plant to use to plant under trees. You can create a uh, sort of nice ground cover that you don't need to mow. Uh, this polymonium. This all of these are going to reseed some. This would be great for a woodland edge. This is great to plant in your um, uh, bee lawn. Rebecca, this one receives um, some. It looks just a really great coneflower, a canadensis. You guys all know this thing. Really aggressive, but man, does it attract the pollinators. Um, this one's a little bit less aggressive. Um, Heath aster, Verbena hastata. This one's going to like, you probably have all seen this growing sort of almost in wetlands and somewhat out, with, whereas this one grows sort of more in the drier conditions. And Zizia, great. Uh, early flowering. Uh, then the, you can get the big list from my stuff, all kinds of organizations. If you go to the Northeast Pollinator Plant website or Riverberry Farm, I've got lists of all these organizations. You can look at it from there as well as the book lists. Um, and then real quickly look at some pictures. And we really need to keep the pollinators. Otherwise, we're all going to go out and pollinate, hand pollinate the world. It's not happening. <laughs> so thank you very much. If you would like to contact me, probably the best way is uh, Jane Thera Sorensen at gmail.com. Um, check out our website. There's lots more information there. And Lisa, I'm sorry I was way over in time. Are there questions? That sounds great, Jane, thanks. There are a few questions. Um, let me go back a little bit in the chat. One person asked, you know, what do you think of no mo may? Of what? No mo oh, may. No, no mo may. I thought it was like somebody's name. No mo may. Um, yeah, it's like, it's sure. Um, but if you don't have anything really growing in there, you know, you might establish them. I would, I sure, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. Um, if you get some clover growing, yeah, great. I would rather see people more aggressively um, saying, I don't need my lawn in this area and, you know, get planting pollinator uh, lawn or just stop mowing all together in some areas. And we really need to be talking to our homeowners associations and allow us to have um, a more pollinator friendly landscapes. Okay. Um, someone said they try to plant flowers, but the deer eat them. Do you have any suggestions? The, what are the deer eating? The flowers, the flowers that they're planting. Uh-huh. Um, that's interesting. The deer are eating them because most of these native plant, native and long-term naturalized plants, um, 
most of them the bees tend uh, the bees the uh, deer tend to um, tend to avoid because and that's they've survived because the deer haven't been eating them. If your deer population is so starved, you know they'll they'll get into eating anything. Um, there are some, there's this Danish product, a Scandinavian product called like skilled, I forget like that. It's something that it's basically blood meal and you probably could just put blood meal out there, but anyway, supposedly discourages them. I haven't used it. Um, I gen generally find we have a huge deer population on our farm, but they tend to not eat, um, my, uh, perennials. They go for, you know, our our food crops instead. Um, Fran asks, she says, she doesn't understand why so many of the plants that you suggested are naturalized and not native. I know you spoke a little bit to that in your uh, presentation. Yeah. Um, yeah. And she said that, you know, in the first part, you said we should plant plants that have co-evolved with the native pollinators. So can you kind of explain that a little bit more? Yeah. I mean, I, I guess, you know, part of my presentation is like a lot of the plants are naturalized in Vermont but they're native in parts of New England and my audience is like all of New England so for a Vermont strictly audience um, there's definitely you know plants that are purely native but honestly I'm finding that most of these naturalized plants are so long-term that I'm recommending are so long-term naturalized you know like Queen Anne's lace oh my gosh that's not a native plant. We sure feel like it's native plant and the visitations to it is is kind of amazing. It's so aggressive that I wouldn't say that we need to plant it. Most everybody has it uh, growing anyway. So, so I, mean, it's, I like the question. I like the question and, and I have to say I'm embracing nat long-term naturalized plants if I have been assured from my own observations and from others' observations that it seems to be a great beneficial plant. It's been here a long time. Uh, the insects seem to have co-evolved with them, Co are um, co-evolving with them. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a question if there is a native eastern clover, a white clover. Uh, yeah, you know, that's interesting. You know, the the white clover and the all-site clover, neither of those are uh, are native, but man, do the bees love them that I do not know of a native white clover. There is a native red clover for sure. Okay, and and we'll go with one last question because it has been a long evening, and I know you need to need to to get on with your evening as well. As what are some deep rooted plants that would do well in the ditches in those wet areas to to hold the soil? Yeah, so if you look at those plant uh, the plant ha the handouts that folks have, anything that um, says it likes it moist, uh, moist to wet, um, will will be great. Almost all of these um, are deep rooted. Um, I find that some of the shallower plants, shallow, uh, shorter ground covery kind of plants tend to be less deep rooted. Not always the case, um, but many. Uh, so in many times, the height of the plant gives you a suggestion. A lot of those native grasses are very, very deep rooted, very deep rooted, way deeper than the plant is tall. I love the suggestion of running a sod cutter because I wanted to do stuff and I'm like, oh, I just can't get rid of this. I'm like, I never thought of that. So yeah, thank you for it's, that. It's amazing. <laughs> there, it's amazing. The, it, it takes no time whatsoever to cut the sod. It's like mowing the lawn you, and you're done. And then the work really is to roll it up and move it out of there. It's like, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> Well, Jane, thank you so much for your presentation tonight. We really appreciate the time that you took. Um, I hope everybody goes out and chooses to do one thing, you know, whether it's treat invasive <laughs> species, choose an area to plant to pollinators, change your lights. Uh, if you have uh, outdoor lights, change those lights to um, motion sensors. Said change your life. <laughs> You can do that too. You can do that too. But I love the suggestion of just changing to motion detected lights because it affects a lot of our insects. Mm. They get attracted to those lights. So there's just a lot of little things that we can all do, uh, especially if you are in a neighborhood talking to your neighborhood association so that uh, these kind of, you know, unmowed areas become more of the norm uh, for, for us into the future. So uh, you have any last words? Uh, I'm typing. 
please feel free to email me, Jane Thera Sorensen at gmail.com. Um, I'm really good at responding to emails. This is my most insanely busiest time of year, but I'm, you know, I'm menopausal. So in the middle of the night, I'll write to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be sure to include that in the, uh, when I send out the link as well. And okay. uh, again, thank you. And on behalf of Land Ethic Vermont, we hope you'll all check out our uh, website on our Vermont Woods to learn more about Land Ethic Vermont and more about Vermont Covered. So you can visit our website as well. So thank you all and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you so much.